powered by Riverside. Hello and welcome into the sad fan where we talk about the good, the bad, and everything that made you sad from the previous week. And there are so many places where we could start this week's show. Like there was a World Series and the Rangers won their first one and no one cared. No one cared because football took over right away. It was sad, but we're going to move on too because we got to start in the obvious place. And that obvious place is now I know that all I need to get onto a college football sideline is a Fu Manchu, some sunglasses, and to pretend like I like Central Michigan. So this is, of course, the Connor Stallion story. And it, it honestly blows my mind, everything that keeps coming out. We've talked about it last week, and we're going to keep talking about it moving forward. But just the different variances of things that have occurred throughout this story and the layers and layers that we keep getting. And uh, another thing that happened after we last talked was Ryan Day is apparently the person that hired the private investigator to bust Michigan's Jim Harbaugh and find out exactly what was going on. How did Michigan get so good when they were so bad? And why was the one year that they were terrible, Jim Harbaugh's worst record, the year that no one was allowed in the stands, COVID-19 2020. And it all boiled down to this gentleman, Connor Stallions, who has since left his role at Michigan. And at first it started out as a firing. And now it's being said that he stepped away from the team or he parted ways amicably. All of this is absolutely insane to me. But I stand by what I was saying last week, though this is completely crazy, and and I like I said, all you need is a Fu Manchu and a root for Central Michigan to get onto a sideline, and then Jim McElwain, all uh, who is the head coach of of Central Michigan, will say all the right things. Like there's so many people on the sidelines, they 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 never know who it could be or where it could be. And I'm sitting here, if I'm the AD of Central Michigan, what is going on, right? Because it appears Connor Stallions was on their sideline and filming the signals sent to Michigan State. I don't care. I don't think anyone should care. I don't think most of the other coaches care. I think that it's only an issue because Michigan got caught. Everyone's probably doing this. I'm not going to be absolutist about it. But everyone's probably stealing signs to some extent. Everybody's looking for any advantage they could possibly find in this sport. And at the end of the day, nothing's going to happen to Michigan this season. Uh, there might be something that happens later on, after the season's over, uh, a retroactive punishment, if you will. But as of right now, Michigan's in the playoff. Uh, maybe if they lose to Penn State or Ohio State, there will be a punishment. But right now, I just, I don't think anything's going to happen. And I don't think the world thinks anything is going to happen to Michigan. We're going to get more college football playoff headlines to talk about because they're going to put some random teams in there, even though it's very clearly the University of Washington that has the best record because they beat the number six team. Whereas uh, if you follow the ratings, Ohio State has only beaten Penn State, who is the number 10 team. And if they really do pay attention to these games, they wouldn't really hold that Ohio State-Notre Dame game in such high esteem because Notre Dame forgot to put people on the field. They beat a Notre Dame defense that had 10 men on the field. I think it's going to be a fun season. I know we're already a fun end of the season, part of me. I know we're already at the end here, but take into consideration all of these storylines and just be grateful. You've got Connor Stallions at Michigan. You've got uh, Caleb Williams crying in the stands with his mother after losing uh, his game to Washington this week. And honestly, there's a lot of pressure on him, and I get it, but him and his father put all this pressure on them when they said that they're making so much money in college that they may just forego the draft if they don't like the team that's going to draft Caleb Williams. And and they're going to ask for ownership stake and whatever. And then you, you go out and you lose over and over again. So feel for him. But everybody has been through something that makes them want to cry to their mother. All right. He's not the only one. We're not going to sit back and go, what a great moment. We're going to go, yeah, it's a regular damn moment. It's a regular damn moment that happens around the world every single day. Uh, and we're only watching it because this kid is good at football uh, in college. We don't even know how good he's going to be in the pros. 
Speaking of the pros and pro football, I've got to apologize to C.J. Stroud. I have to do it, and I don't want to, but he is the first Ohio State quarterback to ever look this good in the NFL. He had a phenomenal game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this weekend, and I felt great for him, and I felt great for his team, and I felt great for second-round draft pick Tank Dell at wide receiver, but I felt terrible for Baker Mayfield because Baker Mayfield did absolutely everything he could to win this game, right? And C.J. Stroud announced himself, thrown to the likes of Noah Brown, and like I said, rookie Tank Dell, Nico Collins, and he looked amazing. He can clearly throw the ball. He can clearly navigate through adversity because he doesn't have much of a team in Houston. Doesn't have much of a defense, doesn't have much of an offensive line, but he's finding ways to win games. And that to me is the mark of someone that's going to be a very great NFL quarterback. So CJ Stroud, I apologize as profusely as possible. Uh, I hope you keep it up and I hope you prove me wrong about Ohio State quarterbacks saying they're all system quarterbacks because he, he looks absolutely phenomenal. He is the cherry on top of a rookie class that has been really, really, really good. Uh, and one of the players included in this rookie class is, of course, B. John Robinson. And B. John Robinson is someone that Arthur Smith is going to get uh, fired over, I think, because the recent quotes from Arthur Smith were that he is great at he's great at pulling defenders away and allowing them to do what they want to do on offense. To which most fantasy owners, I I'm not one of them, but we're like, what are you talking about? And most people that watch the game that know him to be good are going, give him the damn ball. He's the best offensive weapon on that team, right? Kyle Pitts hasn't done anything since his first game in the NFL. Uh, Drake London is hurt. So B. John Robinson is clearly their best option, very clearly. And they're starting Taylor Heineke at quarterback. So what do they have to lose? They really don't have anything to lose. They could put Bijan Robinson in, see what they have in this young kid running back. And I know he's had uh, some brain fog issues, some injuries, but at the end of the day, you've got to see what you have in him. And as he's played, he's looked like a superstar. The Falcons are not going to make the playoffs. They're not going to be great, but they're a really in a great spot right now to see one of the premier or what could be the premier running backs or athletes in the NFL. And I'd really like to see that happen. And I don't think that Arthur Smith will last if it doesn't, right? If you don't start playing that high draft pick and you start, don't start to use him to his full capabilities, you're going to get fired because you're clearly not the coach that can use or maximize the talent that has been put around him to put the best product on the field because you're not giving the ball to your best player. I want to go back to college for a moment, and I want to talk about Bedlam, Oklahoma versus Oklahoma State. Not because Oklahoma State won the very last one, and I think Oklahoma leads the series like 95-19. Or something like that. So it wasn't really much of a rivalry, but it was a game that Oklahoma State fans and Oklahoma State very clearly uh, cared about. But the reason I want to go back to it is because of what Oklahoma State's announcing team did to Oklahoma. They played. So Oklahoma, for those of you that don't know, some backstory here. Oklahoma and Texas announced that they're going on to the SEC next year. So this is probably the last bedlam you'll ever see. So hopefully you tuned in to watch because it was a great game. And uh, if you can tell by the context clues I'm giving, Oklahoma State won the game. So let's get to the funny thing that the uh, – it wasn't the play-by-play. -play. I, I suppose it would be the DJ in Oklahoma State. What did he do? Well, at the very end of the game, as all the fans are leaving and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are leaving the field, he played Taylor Swift's We Are Never Getting Back Together. And if you watch our show and you follow us, you know that if there's something that we appreciate on the sad fan, it is a good sense of humor. And I think what a play. Well played, sir, to play. We are never getting back together after you beat Oklahoma in the Battle of Bedlam, the very last one. What a way to go out. Great job, Oklahoma State. That is phenomenal. We had a game in Germany, though. It was two teams that we believed to be insanely exciting on offense. And we thought we were going to see fireworks in Frankfurt. And we just didn't. There was nothing going on in Frankfurt. It was one of the more boring games of the year. It was on very early for folks in America. It's regular time for us over here in Europe. 
But it was Patrick Mahomes versus Tua Tagovailoa and the firepower of the Miami Dolphins offense, completely healthy outside of HM. And the Kansas City Chiefs with the best quarterback in the NFL, Andy Reid, who many believe to be the best coach in the NFL, multiple Super Bowls, and it's 21 to 14. And the game ends on a bobbled snap, a fumbled snap, which is just, I can't think of many worse ways to end a game that was just starting to get exciting. Fourth and 10. What are we going to get here? Is Tua going to get it? And the Miami Dolphins is a team that can easily get 10 yards. And it's a fumbled snap is what we get. That's what we give to Germany. That's what we leave with the with Germany with. And then we, we're going to send them to make up for that game, which was supposed to be just a barn burner. We're going to send them the Bill Belichick coached Patriots, but not of 2002 or 2010 or 2013. We're sending them the Bill Belichick Patriots that are his worst team ever that this is the worst team he's ever coached okay and who are they playing against they're playing against good old Minshew magic the colts not exactly two marquee teams in the nfl not exactly two teams that we expect to be there at the end not exactly two teams that we find exciting and this is what we're going to end the european tour with and i feel bad i'm sorry this is not what american football is so to everyone that goes out to these games I hope you have a good time. I hope the environment's amazing. And I apologize on behalf of everyone because none of us want to watch that game either. Nobody wants to watch the Patriots versus the Colts. Not even Indianapolis or Boston wants to watch Indianapolis, uh, pardon me, Indianapolis versus the Patriots. It's just a toilet game. And we apologize. The NBA also released their in-season tournament this week. The first ever NBA in-season tournament. There's not a lot to talk about because no one really understands it, right? They know that some of the games count for the regular season record and some of the games don't. They know that if you win, you get a trophy. But the one takeaway that everyone seemed to have was, what the hell is up with these courts? Because of the way these basketball courts were painted. So it was wacky, and if people didn't know there was an NBA tournament going on, they would have no explanation or reasoning behind the weird basketball courts that their favorite team was playing on. I don't know if I'm excited about this. I think it's interesting. I think that it's something that European footballers have been doing for a long time, playing in multiple tournaments, uh, each one giving them an opportunity to win a trophy throughout the year, mid-season. But I just don't know how to feel about it. I, I honestly don't. The in-season NBA tournament is kind of weird to me, especially because some of the games count. And all I can say to you is I find it interesting. I wish they would get rid of these courts because it, it definitely reminds me of when the NFL did Color Rush. So I hope some of our audience will remember that. But there was a while back we were doing Thursday Night Football. And what could we do to get people to watch? Because, I mean, people are going to watch football regardless, but we're going to complain because the Thursday night game is always terrible. It's always two terrible teams that people don't really want to watch. But if you have money on the game, if you're gambling, if you have some fantasy players, maybe you'll check it out. But how can we entice people to watch outside of that? Color Rush, which is like, let's put these teams in brightly colored uniforms. And the one thing that came out quite a bit was, what about people that are colorblind? Like, how are they supposed to watch this? And that thought just crept into my head as I'm watching some of these games for the NBA in-season tournament. What if somebody is colorblind and they want to watch this game? What what are they going to be seeing? What is going on there? I hope we start to consider some of these things. All right, last but not least, some of you that tuned in last week saw, we announced the news of Joshua Daniels firing live on air as it happened. Some of you had to catch that after we recorded on our podcast stream or on our YouTube channel. But we were there. We got it right away in the middle of the night here in England. Uh, or pardon me, in the middle of the morning here in England, in the middle of the night there in America when the Raiders announced it. And I was very ecstatic and happy. And I'm even more ecstatic and happy based on the news that Jake Glazer, Jake Glazer, pardon me, gave to the Fox NFL crew, which was that all of this came to fruition when the team had a meeting that Josh McDaniels was a part of, Antonio Pierce was there. And the team, the Las Vegas Raiders, really just unloaded on Josh McDaniels. And they were unleashing frustrations, irritations with his coaching style, with what he had done to the team, with some of his standards of how the team should be operating and what they should do and how they should uh, 
be handling personnel decisions and what they have done with personnel decisions and basically tore Josh McDaniels up one side and down the other. Josh McDaniels had an opportunity to respond and Antonio Pierce spoke on behalf of Josh McDaniels. And Antonio, uh, Antonio Pierce drew, who is now the interim head coach of the Raiders, drew on his experience as an NFL football player. And one thing came to mind while he was giving the speech, and that was the season where they beat the undefeated New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. Why not tell a team that's having a rough go of things and venting about the head coach a story about how everyone counted you out and how it was really up to you and the people in the locker room to believe that you could win out the season, that you could beat any team. And he discussed how that carried them all the way to a Super Bowl win against what could have been the best team any of us had ever seen, the only undefeated team outside of the Miami Dolphins of 1972. But instead of thanking Antonio Pierce after that speech, instead of agreeing with Antonio Pierce, instead of lifting up the Raiders, in this moment, Josh McDaniel pulled Antonio Pierce aside and said, don't you ever talk about the New England Patriots like that again. And when that news came out, all I could think to myself is, what a loser. What a baby and how happy I am that you were let go. You never want to see somebody lose their job. But when they appear to be a total, just for lack of a better word, uh, douchebag, he deserved this. And there's now stories coming out that Josh McDaniels was fired on Halloween and he had to tell his kids Halloween night. No, you didn't, Josh. So shut up. Even if you were following, fired on Halloween night and you got the news that you were fired on Halloween night, you're a multimillionaire that's not doing too bad, that can run and cry in the arms of Bill Belichick, that kids are going to be just fine. You could have told them the next day. You could have told them, told them a couple days later. So all you're doing right now is trying to garner sympathy and you're not going to get it, I hope. Because everyone should know now that you're a giant jerk. And if you follow us on Twitter at the Sad Fan 12 or the Sad Fan Cast, you know that I retweeted out a video, uh, I believe it was last year, of Brandon Marshall really going in on Josh McDaniels and wondering why people couldn't see it. And I was doing the same thing. I was like, why can't you see this guy is a jerk? The players don't like him. Nobody wants to play for him. He makes bad play calls, he makes bad personnel decisions. I, I just can't seem to grasp what is going on here and why it is that this person is still in power, is still a head coach, and now he's fired. And whatever, the debate will begin, good or bad, but I know that the Raiders went out on Sunday and they beat Antonio Pierce's former team, the New York Giants, and they beat them handily. And Max Crosby looked phenomenal. The offense looked competent, not not amazing, but competent. But the 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 note to take away was these players were playing free and you could see it. You could see it was like a weight had lifted off their shoulders. And I think that speaks to how much a coach can matter, whether the coach be bad or good. And Josh McDaniels, make no mistake about it, was bad. Ziegler was a terrible general manager. Absolutely god awful. Honestly, their claim to fame is they drafted all Patriots that had never won anything. Or not drafted, pardon me, signed in free agency. All Patriots that had never won anything. That's what they did, and they expected that to go a long way. They expected that to be a winning mentality. And you brought in Patriots that didn't win anything. That's You want to d duplicate the Patriot way? That's not a thing in Las Vegas. That was not a thing in Oakland. You have the Raider way. And right now, the Raider way has been hurt because no one can seem to find it over a couple of years. But golly, if we're going to lose, let's lose being renegades. Let's lose being tough. Let's lose without a crybaby head coach as Josh McDaniels was that can't fathom not being accepted by the team and can't fathom anyone insulting him. I mean, he was an ego monster that was bad at his job. His record shows that he was bad at his job and he's gone now. And I don't think he's ever going to get another head coaching job, nor should he. So let's end the show with the most important topics. G string gate in Philadelphia with the staffer. Now, obviously, I'm just kidding. This is the biggest story of the day, but it is topical, and I think it's funny. Uh, if you want to follow anything Philadelphia Eagles, you should follow this story where one of the staffer fell on the ground and appeared to be wearing a red G-string. I think it's hilarious. I think it's funny. I think a lot of people are going to have fun with it. If I'm this guy, 
you got to do an interview and you just got to lean into it. You know, you just got to be like, yeah, so what? Well, who cares what undergarments I wear? My team is seven and one and we're crushing everyone and we're going to keep winning, right? We just beat the Dallas Cowboys. I would lean into it, own it, uh, own who you are. And just like I hope all of our fans, I hope you own it. I hope you own who you are. I hope you had fun with us this week. The crew should be back next week for a full episode, but we want to make sure we gave you something and let you know we are here for you and we will be reviewing as many sports as we can within the hour that we have every single week. And we will bring them to you right here on the Sad Fan Podcast Network on YouTube. And you can also reach us at the Sad Fan Cast on Twitter or the Sad Fan 12. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you next week.